Welcome back guys. I'm starting out by saying thanks because this marks the 10th episode in my new YouTube endeavor and that's a cool milestone for me. It's also one month of putting out content like this and I'm really happy with how it's all gone so far. You guys have been great and I just wanted to say thanks for watching. Thanks for all of the comments. Thanks for the constructive criticism, the feedback on how to make this stuff better. I just, I really appreciate every bit of it, especially you guys subscribing to see more of this stuff. So thank you. Today, we are gonna dive into looking at engine mounts and how to get this part of the project started. I kind of glossed over it last time and I realized, especially after some of you commented, that I really need to like take the camera and stick it in the engine bay and show you what I'm looking at and kind of what I'm working with, what I'm seeing and what I'm trying to absorb and understand because that's what you're here to see. I've said before that I think getting the engine mounted in the engine bay is the most important part of forward progress on the engine swap. Nothing else can really happen until the engine is attached to the car. And so we need to look at the points on the engine where engine mounts need to be designed and then kind of look at the chassis and see how those two need to relate with each other and talk about how to make those overlap. We're not gonna make engine mounts today, but we're gonna take that first step. And I wanna talk about the importance and, and some of the ways to approach that problem because even though this is a kind of a front wheel drive engine going in the back of a car, it's a Ferrari, things like that, it's still the same principles that apply to any engine swap. I've done a bunch of them at this point from 1JZs into E28s and S38s into tube chassis to LSs into Land Cruisers and Coyotes into Model As and all of the, sim the same ideas still apply. We need to put the engine together with the chassis. So let's take a look at what constraints we're working with and then we're gonna build up from there. So we're picking up right where we left off in the last episode and that's with the engine sitting on the frame rails of the car. The oil pan is sitting down here on the passenger side frame rail and then on this side I have the transmission kind of propped up on a block of wood that is also sitting on the chassis rail. And that's to get the engine loosely level but as you can see, one of the problems we're working with at the moment is that it's sitting a little high. It might not be too high at the moment. You can kind of see, looking at that, that this is where the engine cover actually kind of sits on, is, is this surface here. And then it does have some height to it. So it doesn't mean that the engine is too high, but it's definitely close. And I'd like to find some ways to improve that because Lowering the engine is going to give us a better center of gravity. You always want the engine as low as you can make it without putting things like the oil pan in harm's way. So we need to take a look at that. And then we also need to kind of come up with some ideas of where it needs to go left and right and fore and aft. Now, there's not a real formula or perfect answer for where that stuff's going to be. And so one thing that I'd like to do is make or design a mount system that has some adjustability to it before it's all welded together. If I can design something that I can move around a little bit, allows for some modularity or adjustment before I actually place welds on it and I fix everything in place, that's gonna give us the best chance for success because it's admittedly really hard to position an engine in the car just without engine mounts and get it right where you want it if you're balancing it on things like frame rails and two by fours. The other thing that we need to figure out very early on in this process is driveline and axle angles. And so what we're looking at right here is the transmission from the Honda. And we have an axle output on each side of this. There's one right here and then one that mirrors it on the other side right there. And this side does have an intermediate shaft that comes out and attaches to the block. I'll show you guys that in a minute. Uh, that makes the axles equal in length, but this is essentially what we're looking at. And the Ferrari engine and transmission were located further back overall. That Ferrari transmission center line was all the way back here. And you can tell this is going to be an issue because if we were to come straight out of this side of the transmission with an axle, we'd hit this on each side. That, that member here, this part of the chassis is not going to be able to stay. It simply won't work. Now it is worth noting that the angle for the hubs there, in order to hit them, it does not need to pass through the center of this hole. You can tell 
that that hub is offset very far forward. And in the Ferrari, those axles actually angled forward in order to hit them correctly. In our case, we're going to need to move this vertical chassis member in order to hit them. So we're going to have to redesign some of this and come up with something a bit different. Loosely, what I'm thinking, because it's important to have some reinforcement there, that's how the uh, upper control arm is mounted, this is a very important point on the chassis, is we do have a lot of room to come up. We're gonna have a turbo manifold in here, but we also have a whole trunk that we can remove. There's a lot of space to play with. So building some structure that goes across the car and provides some reinforcement and ties all that in is probably gonna be the way to do that. If there's room for me to triangulate down anywhere, we will do that as well. So the other thing that we can look at is from this angle to get an idea of how these axles line up. So obviously the hub side lines up with the center of the wheel here. But if we kind of glance in here, we can see what the alignment is like because that black dot in there is our transmission output located there in the middle of that crevice. And that's gonna pass through and needs to line up or at least be somewhat close to the center line of this wheel, but they're really not that far off. They're somewhat close together. We're talking about a couple of inches, a lot of which the angle of CV axles can absorb. We'll see if we can see some on this side too. So here, right there, that hole is our transmission output, and we gotta get an axle to the center of our wheel. So if you're wondering why not just move the engine further back so that the axles can pass through those holes, it's because the upper control arm mounts are immediately above that point and we cannot move those without completely reconfiguring the car. We'd have to really redesign some stuff. It doesn't make sense to approach the problem that way. Uh, the engine cannot move much further back than it is right now without colliding with the upper control arm mounts. So we need to work around it underneath them. And I also just don't want to move the engine further back. That's going to, you know, disrupt our weight balance. We want it as far forward as we can get it. So I think modifying the chassis is the easiest way to go about it. So I'll flip the camera around again and show you a little bit of what I'm thinking about how to accomplish that. I've got a couple of ideas that I'm probably going to have to evolve as we, as we make some forward progress. So you can see here on this member that the upper control arm mount is just on the other side of this. You can kind of see it through there and you can see it spans this horizontal member. And you can tell we're already really close to the engine. We can't move the engine further back and we don't have much room over here either. So truth be told, we need to modify what's in our way as opposed to moving the engine more. This support is really important because it does provide support for that control arm. So I'm thinking because we have so much space up in the engine bay, even though we are going to have a turbo manifold coming off the back of the engine, we can get rid of all this trunk space. We can cut it out. We can do whatever we want. So providing more structure down in this area really isn't going to be hard to do. I'm thinking maybe we build something that kind of bridges this, offers some, some cross support. We might even be able to come down and triangulate into this part of the chassis. So maybe some members that, that come, you know, from here and triangulate down, maybe back, you know, cross them and tie in as an X, maybe even come up and, and, and brace up to these points. I mean, there's a lot of options it's just a matter of spatial constraints. So now we're in this pickle of what comes first, the chicken or the egg? Do we modify the chassis now before designing engine mounts? Do we design engine mounts and then modify the chassis to match? It's kind of a puzzle and I'm not gonna say there's a right answer. If I had to say ultimately what's the best approach, it would probably be to modify the chassis now and then begin moving the engine. But I wanna look at the engine itself and show you guys how it needs to mount because where it needs to mount is gonna play into that decision. So let me show you the three places that I know we're gonna be using engine mounts. 
The first engine mount is gonna come off of the top of the transmission, it's on this side. And so there are a handful of places that we can tie into, but essentially there's a mount factory that comes off of this and ties into what would normally be a chassis rail here, which we don't have. What I'm thinking we're gonna do is build some form of structure that will triangulate this point here, since we're gonna be removing this member, we need to strengthen it, kind of up to the, to the chassis up here, which will strengthen all of this area here. And then we can have a mount that can be positioned anywhere in this area. If we, if we make a nice plate or, or something like that, that goes there, we can really start to move a mount freely in 3D space, which solves some of these how do we position it questions. The other mount that we're working with is located down here, and you can see part of the original Honda mount remains. We've got a triangle, a triangle of mounts right here, as well as one more partition, but essentially these three bolts are what Honda uses to have a mount that comes off of the block there's, there's a partition here, here, and then one here that we were using to lift the engine. So you can kind of get an idea of how Honda mounts to that. And so we're going to use these holes in the, in the cylinder head to mount the engine. And then what we're going to tie it to is this part of the chassis. Now, I'm not inclined to say that this is truly, really strong. It wasn't ever meant to hold a car. So we're going to have the same approach on this side. We need to reinforce this segment here because we're gonna remove this rail, this tube. And so being able to tie this in up to this point and then mount freely in 3D space here is gonna be really crucial. We also can triangulate this point to the other side, to the top, down. We have a lot of options to make this stronger. And remember, Triangles, for the most part, are kind of the strongest shape. It's the best way to design stuff like this to, to really make it rigid, strong, and lightweight. So we're not going to make it overly complicated. We want to keep it simple. I also don't want what we add to the chassis to stick out like a sore thumb. And because all of this is really simple chassis work, it's mostly square tubing, some round, and really rudimentary, we're going to do a better job than Ferrari did, but we're not going to try to go crazy custom flashy because it's gonna look too odd, I think. I don't know, we'll see. We'll see how we get into it. All right, so the third engine mount's gonna be off of the back of the engine. On this side, we've got partitions on the block. There's some here, here, and even some down here that we can use to build structure off of that can then come down and we're gonna tie it into this, this chassis member here. This is what originally supported the V8. And so having a nice, really stout arm coming down is gonna support the engine really well. And it's also gonna keep it from wanting to rock back and forth. And that's gonna be good. It's really gonna help keep this thing rigid and tight. And so seeing as we're gonna be mounting from the block to this rail, we're also probably gonna be tying in from this point up here sorry for the focus, down to this point, we're really gonna be relying a lot on this part of the chassis for some strength. So we may need to, to triangulate it further to reinforce it, to make it stronger because we're gonna be relying on it for a lot of support. Now there is one other engine mount I might be able to use. I have to do a little bit of research because I haven't seen it used on other cars. However, there is a partition on the block on our front side of the engine, the side of the engine that is facing the front of the car. If I can build an arm off of these partitions down to the chassis rail that supported the original V8 on the front side, then we're talking about something that's really strong, really robust, and I'll probably eliminate that upper mount on the passenger side. That seems needlessly complicated to mount. That would leave us with the one on the front of the engine, one on the back, and one supporting the transmission. We'll have to see though. Now, I'm apologizing now if once I get this video into editing, if it's all over the place. This is my first time really trying to like talk and work with the camera at the same time and point things out. I know some things are out of focus, so work with me a little bit, but let me know if this is kind of moving along at the, at the right pace, if I'm covering things at all and it makes sense, because 
I'm not a teacher. That's, that's my girlfriend. That's what she does. I'm learning from her. The other thing at hand at the moment that I'll touch upon is improving the weight balance left and right of the car. So obviously the engine is very offset towards the passenger side. We can move it towards the driver's side a bit, but not a ton. One thing that is going to help with that though, is this car has two gas tanks in it. They're saddle tanks, one on each side. The passenger side is smaller than the driver's side. In total, I want to say they come out to somewhere right around 18 gallons, give or take. It's quite a bit of fuel for a car this size. I don't need that much fuel. So what we're going to do is we're going to pull out the fuel tank that's on the passenger side where the engine is offset towards. We're going to get rid of that fuel tank and help with the weight distribution. Once this thing has a fuel, full tank of fuel and me sitting in the driver's seat, we're really going to find that this, this thing starts to balance out. I'll show you. So this is the driver's side fuel tank and it's give or take, I don't know, maybe 10, 11 gallons, something of the sort. And you can see a lot of the old parts of the fuel system coming off of it. And there's a crossover pipe down below, if you see here, that goes across and ties into the other side. And this down here is the passenger side fuel tank. You get a better look at it in the wheel well. We're gonna get rid of this whole tank entirely. We don't need it, we don't need that much fuel in the car, and it's gonna help with our weight balance. It'll also give us a bit more room to work on the belt drive side of the engine. So there is an alternator down there, there is a belt, you know, the damper. If we wind up going dry sump on this engine, there's gonna be an oil pump down there, and that will help with room and access for serviceability, which is really important on a car, even if you're gonna drive it every day or a race car that you wanna get back on track. These things are things to think about. They are crucial when you're doing an engine swap. If you do something and you're not thinking far enough ahead, you're gonna wind up with an engine that you have to pull out to do something simple like an alternator, or you have to disassemble a ton of other stuff, and it doesn't make sense to do that. Okay, so how do we go about beginning the mount design process? Well, we've talked about some of the chassis changes that probably need to happen. So we could start by modifying that. We've also talked about where the engine's mount partitions are and how those might need to translate to, in order to attach to the chassis. And so we can start there as well. I'm not gonna pull the engine out today and start cutting up the chassis. I'm, I don't think I'm quite there yet to start making permanent changes like that. But what we can do is look at the engine block and the cylinder head and start with the engine side of the mounts. That part of this is probably not going to change with relation to where the engine's gonna go. We know that plates need to attach to the engine in three different places, and then a mount is gonna come off of that. So how do we do that? Well, I'm lucky because my good buddy, Daniel, out in Australia, Oxer, as I affectionately know him, is a Honda fanatic. He's been part of my inspiration for wanting to dive into an engine like this. And he was kind enough to put together a 3D scan of this engine for me. So I'm gonna cut to him doing the process of that. He's gonna tell us a little bit about what's going on. And then we'll talk about how that helps. Hey guys, Oxer from Stansworks here. We're just doing some 3D scanning for Mike's Ferrari build. So the scanner that we're using is the Artec Leo. It's pretty basic in terms of its use, but it's pretty crazy in terms of functionality. So we've just done a new download update and it allows us to choose a HD mode, which picks up way more information. Basically, this is gonna allow Mike and Nick to be able to manufacture components intake manifolds, sump, engine mounts, using all the factory locations. As you can see, it's pretty basic in terms of how easily the scanner picks up all the reference data. No need for any reference points. It's literally just like waving a wand. So once we've got the data, you can then go through it, zoom in, double check, change the quality, make sure that you've 
accounted for all the spots that you need. And then if we go back out here, this one was one that I did earlier. Basically a full 3D scan of a K-series motor. So we can take that engine information and put it in the computer and design a mount very specifically to fit this engine. And truth be told, I'm probably gonna do that at some point. My very close friend, Nick Foster, one of the members of Proto Machine, who's up in Seattle, is a aerospace engineer, unbelievably talented mind. He's going to help me engineer a fully drawn and machinable engine mount because in the end, I think I might want something CNC'd on this. I think that'd be cool. But what I'm going to do in the meantime is I'm going to, to, to hand make some templates. I'm gonna draw them up in Fusion 360 and we'll probably get some mounts CNC water jetted. And the reason for that is because I know not everybody has access to a 3D scanner. That's not a realistic way to approach projects like this. And I want to, to tackle the side of this that makes sense for you guys too. You don't even have to have CAD software to do this, although Fusion 360 is, I believe, free for people that are hobbyists that are making things for themselves. And it's really easy to use, very intuitive. You can do some crazy powerful stuff with it. I want, to, I want you guys to be able to take that software or just take cardboard and a pen and paper and do the part of this like a garage builder. We're gonna make some simple mounts that we can use to get this engine mounted and located so we can make forward progress because we're not just gonna sit here and wait for a CNC solution. That's gonna to take too long, but we can use that further down the line. I do think I'll save that for the next episode though. It's a great place for me to actually come in and start recording tomorrow. I can put together another round of content right away. So next episode, we're gonna bust out the cardboard and the pens, the scissors, and I'm gonna show you guys how I approach this kind of problem and we'll make the engine side of these motor mounts or at least the base plates for them. I will catch you guys next episode. Thank you again, as always, for watching.